Okay, chapter 20 deals with um, respiratory tract infections. We'll talk about the anatomy and physiology of the respiratory system, describe symptoms that let us determine the difference between upper and lower respiratory infections and what kind of organisms cause them, and explain mechanisms of parthenogenesis for major agents of respiratory tract infections and relate pathogenic mechanisms to disease prevention and strategies for microbes that hit the tract. And in this section, we'll talk about the anatomy and physiology of the tract, describe the relationship of the eyes, ears, nose, and the upper airways, and talk about the role of the mucociliary escalator in the respiratory infection process. So this is a quick review of the components of the respiratory system. The respiratory system functions to move air into and out of the lungs and provides a surface for gas exchange. The upper respiratory tract consists of the external nose, nasal cavity, and pharynx. The lower respiratory tract includes the larynx, trachea, bronchi, and lungs. Inhaled air enters the nasal cavity where it is cleaned, warmed, and humidified on its way through the pharynx, a shared region of the respiratory and digestive systems. Leaving the pharynx, air enters the larynx where two pairs of ligaments, together with the mucosa covering them, form the vestibular and vocal folds. These folds help prevent foreign particles, including food, from entering the lower respiratory system. The vocal folds are also known as the true vocal cords because they produce sound when air passes between them. Air next enters the tracheobronchial tree. The trachea, a 10 to 12 centimeter long tube supported by C-shaped cartilages, maintains an open passageway to and from the lungs. The trachea divides into two primary bronchi. As the bronchi enter the lungs, they continue to divide into smaller and smaller bronchi and ultimately into terminal bronchioles. Each terminal bronchiole divides repetitively to form respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and alveolar sacs. Each alveolar sac is formed by a group of alveoli. Alveoli are surrounded by pulmonary capillaries. The ultra-thin walls of the alveoli and capillaries serve as a surface for gas exchange between the air and blood. Oxygen diffuses across this membrane into the blood, while carbon dioxide moves from the blood back into the air where it is expelled during exhalation. So what you're looking at here are some of the different components of the respiratory system and the diseases that we're going to discuss that impact each of these regions in both the upper and the lower respiratory system. Okay, Notice that there are some caused by uh, virus, some caused by bacteria, some caused by fungus. Okay, And there are even some that are um, that can be caused by protozoa. Okay, So in this section we're going to talk about the signs and symptoms of upper and lower respiratory tract infection, talk about mutation and flu pandemics, and list the risk factors for upper and lower respiratory tract infections and identify the causes of the major viral respiratory infections based on the symptoms that they cause in the patient. So the first thing that we want to look at is, is to look at the uh, common cold and sinusitis. So let's take a listen. This is the University of Sheffield Health Service screencast. This is a screencast on the common cold. Have you got a cold or have you just had one? Colds can affect people throughout the year, not just in winter. There are many different types of viruses that can cause a cold. These can be found in the nose, mouth and eyes of a person who has caught a cold. They can also travel in air droplets if sneezed or coughed out and can settle on non-living objects. Colds can affect the ears, nose, throat, sinuses and voice box. When you have a cold you can expect to have some or all of the following features. Fever, 
minor headaches, sinus pains over your cheeks and above your eyebrows, nasal congestion, coughing green yellow sputum, earache, sore throat and a hoarse voice. Features that would be unusual for a cold would be if they were rapidly worsening with time, if the fever or headache was not calming down with simple measures, if the cough produces mucus with blood in it, or if you're unable to tolerate food or you're vomiting. Look out for any of the signs of meningitis. Please enable the annotations function to see the Meningitis Trust web address for information. If you're worried you have the flu, then please ring your GP first rather than attending the health service. So when should you expect to feel better? Usually there is no exact time for recovery from a cold. People start to feel unwell two to three days after catching the cold, but most people feel better within one week. The features can last up to 14 days before things start to improve. So how can you treat your cold? Your body's infection fighting system or immune system will eventually clear the infection itself. The only thing you can do in the meantime is to keep comfortable whilst this is happening. You can try simple things like resting, drinking fluids, eating what food you can manage and taking paracetamol and or ibuprofen regularly for the pain and fever. A pharmacist can tell you if you're safe to use these medicines before you buy them. Cough and cold remedies are no longer available for young children, so you should seek the advice of a pharmacist on what is safe to give your child. So what about antibiotics for a cold? We are often asked if antibiotics help in this situation. Antibiotics can't kill viruses, so the answer is no. Studies show that the vast majority of people who were given antibiotics for a cold would have improved with time anyway. The disadvantages of taking antibiotics are that they can give allergic reactions, have side effects such as stomach upset, and can interfere with other tablets such as the contraceptive pill. This is why doctors prefer not to give antibiotics for colds. For advice on missed time due to illness, please see the annotation for the relevant university website that will give you further advice. If you feel you're going to miss a university assessment or examination due to illness, please try to contact the health service beforehand in case any medical proof is required. People often wonder why they catch so many colds. It's usually the case that each time you may be catching a different type of cold virus that your immune system hasn't previously met. Children tend to catch more colds than adults. This is because adults have built up an immunity against some of the viruses that cause colds. On average, adults have between two and four colds a year, whilst children may have as many as eight or ten. If you have more frequent or more severe infections, see your GP. A healthy lifestyle, including exercise and a balanced nutritious diet, will help your immune system to fight infections. Smokers are prone to chest problems throughout the year. Click on the button to look at our screencast if you're interested in quitting. You should ensure that you're up to date with your vaccinations against more serious illnesses, such as mumps, measles, rubella and meningitis. Please allow the annotations function to see where you can get further information. Remember that you can catch up on all the latest UHS news on our Twitter page. This is the end of our screencast on the common cold. Sinusitis Sinusitis is the inflammation of the paranasal sinuses due to infection. The paranasal sinuses are hollow air spaces in the human skull surrounding the nose. They include the frontal sinuses over the eyes, maxillary sinuses inside each cheekbone, ethmoid sinuses just behind the bridge of the nose, and sphenoid sinuses behind the ethmoids in the upper region of the nose. Each sinus opens into the nose. This permits free flow of air and mucus into the nose. 
Pathology of Sinusitis. When there is a swelling in the nose, such as following an infection or an allergic reaction, the opening of the sinus may get blocked. As a result, air along with other secretions is trapped within the sinus. This subsequently leads to a pressure on the sinus walls, causing the intense pain of a sinus attack. Also, on applying pressure externally on the affected sinus, the patient feels pain. Moreover, as the mucus secretions cannot drain away, bacteria multiply in them, causing infection and fever. One may also have cough and a running nose. The opening of the sinuses can be blocked by other causes like a nasal polyp or a deviated nasal septum. Okay, lower respiratory tract is everything <coughs> below the larynx. An example of this is RSV. Okay, respiratory syncytial virus causes the infected cells to form a syncytia, which is a giant multinucleate cell that um, loses some of its ability to function properly. It's transmissible from person to person. Usually you get this around age two, but you can get it at any age. Infections happen when the virus comes into contact with the mucous membranes of the eyes, the mouth or nose, or through inhalation of droplets from a sneeze or a cough. And basically what you have is um, excessive production of mucus, irritation of the lower respiratory tract, lots and lots of coughing. Okay. Um, next thing we want to look at is the flu. So let's take a listen. People breathe the influenza virus into their lungs, where it enters the cells that line the air passages. The invading virus turns infected cells into virus reproduction factories. Infected cells burst as they become completely filled with viruses. Each virus from a ruptured cell then becomes able to infect another cell. People develop the symptoms of flu, cough, fever, chills, and aches, as more and more cells become infected. The first cells of your immune system that encounter flu viruses are usually macrophages. Macrophages are large white blood cells that circulate throughout the body, alert for foreign intruders. They engulf flu viruses, then move fragments of the viruses, called antigens, to their surface. Macrophages are also called antigen-presenting cells because they display the antigen to white blood cells called T-helper cells. Macrophages activate T helper cells by fitting the flu antigen into a receptor protein, much as a key fits into a lock. Activated T helper cells in turn activate more T cells, which divide into killer T cells and memory T cells. Killer T cells attack and destroy cells infected with flu. They recognize these cells because infected cells also display bits of influenza antigen. Memory T cells remember the virus, enabling the body to recognize that strain of influenza in the future. T helper cells also activate white blood cells, called B cells. Activated B cells divide into plasma cells and memory B cells. Memory B cells remember the virus and help ward off future invasions. Plasma cells produce antibodies that attack a particular flu virus. They destroy some viruses and make others clump together so they can be easily engulfed by macrophages. After the virus is defeated, some antibodies remain in your body. If this strain of flu attacks again, the virus will be overcome before you even know you're infected. So if you're watching this video, I'm pretty sure that at some point in your life, or in the lives of someone you know, they've had the flu. Almost everybody is pretty familiar with how, how awful it feels to get sick with the flu. And when people talk about the flu, they kind of talk about it in two different ways. And we're going we're gonna to get into both of those ways right now. So sometimes they'll talk about the illness or the symptoms they had when they had the flu. And other times they'll talk about the virus, you know, the actual virus that causes the flu. 
So I'm going to actually break it down the same way. We're going to talk first about the illness, and then we're going to get into the virus. I'm going to draw a nice little line down the middle so that we don't uh, get lost in this conversation. So I can't help it, but any time I hear that someone has the flu, I immediately get into this mode where I have a bunch of questions for them, and I really just want to kind of convince myself that when they say they have the flu, they really have the flu, and they don't have something else. So the questions that pop up in my head, the first one is usually, is it abrupt, or did it kind of start abruptly? I'm going to just write that. Was it abrupt? And you know, I might say, do you remember uh, feeling well one evening and then waking up sick or something like that? Do you remember exactly kind of when it started? And most people with the flu can tell you within a day or two exactly when their illness started. Now, another clue that something is the flu is that it usually lasts for about three to seven days. So if someone is saying, well, I got sick with the flu and then four months later, you know, I started getting better. That's a very weird story. Usually it would be a lot quicker than that. So always think around three to seven days. Of course, it could be a few few extra days than that, especially when you're uh, thinking about a symptom like the cough. But generally speaking, that's the time window. Then I really get into the symptoms themselves. I want to find out exactly what made them feel so sick. And there are two categories of symptoms. The first is respiratory symptoms. I want to know about respiratory symptoms. And secondly, I want to know about what I call constitutional symptoms. Constitutional symptoms. And these, uh, this has nothing to do with the constitution, but it has to do with the body, kind of thinking about symptoms that affect the entire body. So let me make a little bit of space on the canvas, and we'll first start out thinking about the respiratory side. So respiratory symptoms, let me draw out air coming into the body. Remember, air has two major paths into your body. It's going to come in through your nose or it's going to come in through your mouth, right? And when it comes in, it's going to quickly join up. Remember, air in the nose is going to meet up with air in the mouth and it's going to go down through the windpipe or the trachea, we call it, and it's going to branch off into the right and left lung. So this is my right lung over here. And on the other side, we've got the left lung. And remember, the left lung is also going to be right next to the heart. So we've got to keep a little space for the heart. So these are the two lungs, and this is the air coming in. Now, if someone says that they have a stuffy nose, that's a really common one, right? They say they're congested, or sometimes they might say a runny nose. But any of these kinds of symptoms, you can think in your mind of this picture, and you can say, well, yep, this is right along the path that air is going to take on its way into the lungs. So this is part of the respiratory track. Now, another symptom might be a sore throat, a sore throat. And here again, you can see that the air is actually going to be passing right through the throat on its way down into the lungs. And a really, really common symptom, you hear this all the time, is cough. And whenever people talk about cough, I just usually think about the lungs being involved there. So these symptoms, stuffy nose, sore throat, cough, you can, you can think of this picture and really you can uh, visualize the air going through and somehow these parts are being involved. Now exactly what's happening is that the virus is of course coming in, right? It's being breathed in. That's how we take in the flu virus. And as it hits these different areas, the cells are getting damaged. And that's that's what we experience as a stuffy nose or a sore throat or a cough. It's really damaged cells that are being affected by the virus. Now, moving on to the other side, the constitutional symptoms. These are symptoms that I want you to think of as affecting the whole body. So this is the whole body. This is, let's say these are the arms and the legs. These are symptoms like fever. Now, if someone says they have fever, it's very hard to point to one exact part of the body that's affected, right? You might say, well, I feel feverish uh, really all over. And if you're feeling feverish, this face would be very sad like that. So if you have symptoms like fevers, and with fevers, oftentimes you get chills as well. I'm going to put that together. If you have fevers or chills, that would be a constitutional symptom. Uh, another one would be something like body aches. You know, if you are in bed because your whole body is aching, you wouldn't point to any one place. You'd say, well, it's just kind of all over. And so that would be another constitutional symptom. Another, another one that jumps to mind is fatigue, kind of the same idea where your whole body is affected here. 
So again, when someone tells me about flu, I'm thinking that they better have at least one of these respiratory symptoms and at least one of these constitutional symptoms. So I think of them in two categories, right? And I want at least one from each category. And they must have both if they're going to get me convinced that they have the flu. So scrolling up just a little bit, just to make sure we don't forget, it's got to be abrupt. It's got to happen uh, over the course of three to seven days. And they should have at least one respiratory symptom and at least one constitutional symptom. Now, this is good if I'm taking care of patients or I'm you know, thinking about a, a clinical setting like the hospital or the emergency room. But what about if you're doing research? Well, it turns out that the Centers for Disease Control, and they do a lot of research around influenza and flu, they have a definition that I want you to know about. Their definition, and you'll see this, is that the person has to have a sore throat or a cough, one or the other, I'll put a big or here, and they have to have fevers. So this is very similar to the definition I just gave you, but this is the definition they use when doing research and when actually presenting data. So it has to have these two things, right? Sore throat or a cough and fevers. And so this is the definition for influenza-like illness. Influenza-like illness. And the short way of saying all this is ILI, uh, influenza-like illness. So this, again, is the definition from the Centers for Disease Control. So if you ever hear ILI, at least now you know what they're considering as being someone that has ILI. So this brings up kind of an interesting question, and that's why I kind of started out by splitting things up between the illness and the virus. I want to go over to the virus side and just keep in the back of your mind this idea of ILI. Now on the virus side, let me just kind of sketch out very quickly in this uh, green color what the influenza virus looks like. I'm going to label this influenza over here. So This is my influenza virus and this little virus has got some RNA on the inside of it. So it's got RNA in here. And I'm going to draw out the RNA just so you can see it. I'm going to use two different colors. So let's use like a purple color here. And one important thing about this RNA is that it's broken up into little pieces, the way I'm drawing it here. So it's got some purple chunks, and let's draw some yellow chunks of RNA as well. And this RNA, of course, is, as I said, genetic material. So it's going to be coding for proteins. So you've got some proteins, and let's say that you've got some proteins out here on the surface. And you know, you could imagine that those yellow proteins come from one of those yellow RNA segments. And you've also got some purple proteins over here, some purple proteins. I'm going to draw out some purple proteins here for you. So let's say that the purple protein, we can call that H, and the yellow protein, we can call that N. So what you're getting here is that you're seeing a couple of the important parts of influenza virus that I just wanted you to start getting familiar with. The fact that it has you know, RNA on the inside, that it's broken up into chunks, that it's got some surface proteins on the outside, uh, and a couple of those important ones, we call them H and N for short. And I'll tell you more about them in, in a future video. So this is influenza virus. And now the question is, if you have someone, let's say I've got a, a friend or a family member who tells me that they had an abrupt illness that was six days and they had fevers and a cough. Well, it sounds like, based on what I said, that this meets, of course, the CDC definition for influenza-like illness. And so if I tested them, let's say I actually you know, checked their nose with a little nose swab and did a test, you would expect that I would actually find influenza in there. And most of the time, I would actually find influenza there. But not always. And this is actually an important concept, that there are actually, believe it or not, some of these little copycat viruses. I'm going to draw a couple copycat viruses here for you. I'm going to write out two of them. There are actually more than two, but we're just going to talk about two of them. And I'm not going to draw them uh, accurately. This is just kind of a, a visual representation, just to kind of show you what what they are, uh, and write up their names. One is called rhinovirus, rhinovirus. And you may be uh, aware that rhino means nose. And actually, rhinovirus loves to infect the nose. And that's actually why it's called rhinovirus. And another 
copycat virus. I'm going to draw it looking a little different, maybe a sideways looking thing, something like this. This guy, this is RSV. RSV. And the, the full name of RSV is respiratory, so you know it affects the lungs, syncytial virus, respiratory syncytial virus. And we'll talk about that another time as well. But the idea here, guys, is that these copycat viruses, and this is interesting, they can actually sometimes fool us into thinking that we're dealing with influenza. Because some of the symptoms you get with rhinovirus and that you get with RSV end up being pretty similar to the symptoms you get with the flu. And so as a result, we have to have some way of telling them apart. And that's why, actually, you may have heard of the term the cold. Let me actually bring this down and actually show you now the cold and the flu side by side and how to kind of distinguish between the two. So when you have, let's say, the flu, we said that usually you would have some respiratory symptoms, check, and you'd have some constitutional symptoms, check. But if you have the cold, kind of the common cold, we call it, then you generally only have respiratory symptoms. You don't typically have fevers and chills and body aches and fatigue. You don't usually have that stuff with the cold. So that's kind of the easy and quick way to distinguish between the flu and the cold. And those are the questions I always ask you know, patients of mine. I say, well, did you have body aches or fatigue? And if the answers to all those kinds of questions are no, I'm thinking, aha, this person has the cold. But of course, this isn't exact, right? This isn't perfect. And that once in a while, people will actually fool you and they will actually have one of these copycat viruses, the rhinovirus or RSV or adenovirus. There are many other ones. And they'll actually have influenza-like illness. They'll actually have sore throat and fevers and body aches. And so this is important to know that every single time we clinically think someone that has you know, flu illness doesn't necessarily mean that they have the influenza virus. Okay, in this section, we're going to talk about the bacterial etiologies of respiratory tract diseases and these diseases' anatomical location. Talk about the relationship between the host and the bacteria that contribute to pathogenesis of respiratory tract infections and compare and contrast clinical presentations of bacterial infections in the respiratory tract and develop a prevention plan for different bacterial respiratory pathogens. So the first topic is going to be otitis media. Though similar, croup and epiglottitis have some distinct characteristics. Croup is a viral infection that results in subglottic edema. Croup usually presents slowly, often with a history of upper respiratory infection. More common in the six-month to three-year age group, signs and symptoms include inspiratory and expiratory stridor, a distinctive seal bark cough, and hoarseness due to swelling of the vocal cords. Epiglottitis is caused by a bacterial infection that results in swelling and inflammation of the epiglottis. Though it may be seen at any age, most cases of epiglottitis are seen between the ages of two to five years. Onset is rapid and may progress in a matter of hours. Signs and symptoms include the tripod position, which causes the epiglottis to fall slightly forward and allows increased air movement, inspiratory stridor, caused by a swollen epiglottis, dysphagia, drooling, and fever. Okay, in this section, we're going to talk about the bacterial etiologies of respiratory tract diseases and these diseases' anatomical location. Talk about the relationship between the host and the bacteria that contribute to pathogenesis of respiratory tract infections and compare and contrast clinical presentations of bacterial infections in the respiratory tract and develop a prevention plan for different bacterial respiratory pathogens. So the first topic is going to be otitis media. Otitis media is an inflammation or infection of the middle ear. This often begins when infections that cause sore throats, colds, or other respiratory or breathing problems spread to the middle ear. Children are more likely to suffer from otitis media than adults. Seventy-five percent of children experience at least one episode of otitis media by their third birthday. 
Children are more likely to suffer from otitis media because they have more trouble fighting infections due to the fact that their immune systems are still developing. Children who have been breastfed often have fewer episodes of otitis media. Common signs of otitis media are unusual irritability, difficulty sleeping, tugging at one or both ears, fever, fluid draining from the ear, loss of balance, unresponsiveness to quiet sounds. A child's eustachian tube is shorter and straighter than in the adult. Fluids will accumulate and cannot drain properly. Adenoids, composed largely of lymphocytes that help fight infections, are larger in children. Enlarged adenoids can, because of their size, interfere with the eustachian tube opening or may become infected, and the infection may spread into the eustachian tubes. A child may have trouble hearing because the eardrum and middle ear bones are unable to move as freely as they should. As the infection worsens, many children also experience severe ear pain. If it is not treated, otitis media may result in serious complications. The hearing loss caused by otitis media is usually temporary, but untreated, otitis media may lead to permanent hearing impairment. Okay, so the bacteria that can travel from the throat up through the eustachian tube into the middle ear um, that cause otitis media in otherwise healthy children include strep pneumonia, haemophilus influenzae, and Marxella catarrhalis. Okay, they each carry a multivalent polysaccharide vaccine. Um, you can get this vaccine at your doctor. That it can protect against strep pneumonia. Remember, though, that um, because of mutation, there's always the possibility that the vaccine will be ineffective against certain strains. The reason, again, for the pain associated with otitis media is the gas that's produced as these bacteria reproduce in the middle ear, right? And that causes the eardrum to, um, to swell and distend and potentially rupture, okay? And at that point, the pain associated with the infection goes away and you get a... Um, a superative pus that leaks in, into the external ear and out the ear canal and then when the drum heals you get scar tissue on the eardrum and that causes your hearing acuity to become reduced and again we have to appreciate the fact that because children have shorter and straighter eustachian tubes they're more prone to these kinds of infections and this is also why we highly recommend that you don't blow your nose when you have a sore throat or a cold you wipe instead okay because that positive pressure in the pharynx in the throat can force this bacteria up through the eustachian tube and into the middle ear. As an adult, the eustachian tube becomes longer and, and more convoluted and it's more difficult for the bacteria to make it from your throat to your middle ear, which is what the, the, the two chambers of the eustachian tube connects. The purpose of the eustachian tube normally is just to regulate the pressure on either side of the eardrum so that it can vibrate in response to sound and you can hear. Okay. Bacterial sinusitis can accompany middle ear infection in children and pneumonia in adults. Inflammation and congestion blocks the sinuses and the mucus flow. We see pressure behind the eyes, pain in the face, and um, foul-smelling nasal discharge. Antibiotics are generally used. Um, we have to remember that the nasal cavity is actually connected to hollow spaces that exist in the maxilla, in the frontal, the ethmoid, and the sphenoid bone, okay? And so those all radiate around the orbits, which is where the eyes are located. And so when they block with inflammation and with mucus, that produces the pressure and the pain associated with this, okay? Pharyngitis is inflammation of the pharynx, tonsillitis, inflammation of the tonsils, laryngitis, inflammation of the larynx, the peritonsillar abscess are abscesses in the pharynx. And we use a different diagnosis for a person complaining of a sore throat, including a variety of viral and bacterial causes, which include infectious mono and diphtheria. Okay, so all these are very painful because there's a lot of nerve endings back there. Um, and um, we need to be 
attuned to the cause, right? Uh, if it's tonsillitis, it, it may require removal of the tonsils. Uh, if it's pharyngitis, um, if it's viral, then we have to wait for it to resolve on its own. If it's bacterial, we might give antibiotics. Um, the same for laryngitis. Um, peritonsillar abscess, usually we try to drain the abscess, and if necessary, um, we can engage in uh, surgical correction. Okay. So streptococcal pharyngitis or strep throat caused by um, streptococcal bacteria, um, for instance, strep pyogenes would be an example. Contain, it's contagious and it's spread through person-to-person -person contact and indirect contact with items contaminated by secretions. We see a sudden onset of high fever and sore throat in large cervical lymph nodes, again, because they're draining the infection from the throat, and so they have to work extra hard to do that, and so they swell up and become painful. Exudate on the tonsils, and there's usually no cough, and we treat with antibiotics, okay, and painkillers. Um, streptococcal pharyngitis, um, strep pyogenes um, is the causative in many cases. It can produce exotoxin. Um, strep pyogenic exotoxin is going to cause a uh, fever and a red rash. We note this as scarlet fever. The rash starts on the head and the neck and spreads to the trunk, then the arms and legs. Some patients may also have a distinctive red bumpy tongue that we refer to as strawberry tongue. Okay, And again, this is um, due to the exotoxin and also the associated histamine release. Okay. We can do a strep test using an immunoassay that's specific for strep pyogenes. We do a throat swab and then we check for the presence of strep antigen, okay? We get a color change if it is positive, okay? Where can streptococcal um, bacteria hide? Where do they go after you have uh, an instance of strep throat? Well, the uh, sequelae are caused by the immune response to the bacteria. This can make antibodies that cross-react with host cells in an autoimmune response, and that can result in um, symptoms coming later that mimic autoimmune disorders, okay? One of the classics is damage to the heart valves, okay? Um, rheumatic fever, which is a cardiac disease, can occur in young children between four and nine. You get high fever and damage to the heart, joint, skin, and the nervous system because of cross-reactive antibodies and the action of T-cell and complement, which are all normally designed to attack the invader, right? But here they get misdirected and they attack cardiac tissue. And then you can also end up with glomerulonephritis, which is an inflammation of the nephrons of the kidney. The nephrons are the filtering units that are able to remove toxins from the blood before the blood is returned to the circulation. Okay. Okay, next topic is going to be diphtheria. AB toxins are proteins that consist of two parts, A and B. The A portion is an enzyme that constitutes the toxic part. The B portion binds to host cell receptors. There are several mechanisms by which AB toxins enter the cell. One mechanism involves the uptake of the toxin after binding by endocytosis. After endocytosis, the contents of the vacuole become acidic, causing the A and B portions to separate. The A portion enters the cytoplasm of the cell and exerts its toxic effect while the B portion is removed from the cell by exocytosis. Different microorganisms produce A toxins with different activities. The A toxin produced by Coronabacterium diphtheriae carries out the transfer of ADP ribose to elongation factor 2, EF2, and thereby inhibits protein synthesis. ADP ribosylation is a common action of AB toxins. Okay, whooping cough is caused by Bordetella pertussis and is uh, transmitted by aerosols, specifically droplets. Um, incubation period from one to three weeks and the disease progresses through catarol which are symptoms of upper respiratory infection and in the paroxysmal stage we get violent 
coughing, followed by deep breaths that make the whooping noise, and then in the convalescent stage, where you're still contagious, um, paroxysms disappear during the next three weeks, and you go into recovery. Right? You can see here um, an inset showing rabbit tracheal endothelial cells infected with virulent Bordetello bronchiaseptasia, which is a close relative of Bordetella pertussis, the agent of whooping cough. Wild type um, bacteria preferentially attached to the cilia and are rarely seen bound to aciliated cells or aciliated portion of ciliated cells. This attachment impedes the ciliary elevator that normally removes bacteria from the lung. Um, Bordetella bronchoseptisa is a common respiratory pathogen of cats and dogs but can cause whooping cough in immunocompromised humans, meaning where the immune system isn't fully functional. Okay? The bacteria have been colored pink in this inset. Okay? And so you can see here um, um, about a decade's worth of data, okay, and then the incidence per person of whooping cough. Okay? Bronchitis is just a blanket term meaning inflammation of the bronchi. It's usually uh, self-limiting and has both viral and bacterial causes. It is going to generate a productive cough, um, so that means that you're going to have mucus in your cough. Acute bronchitis is suspected when the patient's cough persists for more than five days. Community-acquired pneumonia is acquired outside of a clinical or hospital setting. Pneumonia is just an infection that causes inflammation in the lung and is classified as either typical or atypical. Atypical pneumonias are going to hit multiple organ systems, usually producing a normal white count and producing symptoms that appear gradually, mimicking the upper respiratory infections at the onset. It can be caused by mycoplasma, legionella, or chlamydophilia. Okay, so this, these are all um, bacteria. Right? The most common cause of typical pneumonia are organisms like strep pneumonia. Okay? So let's take a look at pneumonia. Pneumonia is the result of the body's reaction to respiratory infections caused by bacteria, viruses, mycoplasma, and other pathogens. The infection causes an increased secretion of fluids and shedded cells to pour into the passages and air sacs of the lungs. The presence of exudate within the air spaces of the lungs causes the coughing, shortness of breath, and fever associated with pneumonia. So when you hear the term pneumonia, I think that most of us think about lung infection, but not much else besides that. And pneumonia really is a little bit more than just a lung infection, really in relation to where it is. So if we're looking at this image here, I want to focus on just the lungs that I've drawn out. So we know that we have a right and a left lung. And in our right lung, I'm just going to draw out some lobes here. We know that we've got three lobes in our right lung. So we have an upper, a middle, and a lower. And in our left, we've got two. And we know that we have an, an airway, so a main airway. Now, don't focus on this yellow line yet. Just focus on our main airway. So we know that we breathe in air, and that air is going to travel down through these smaller branches, these branches that branch off. And at the end of our airway, we have these little grape-like sacs. So I'm just going to draw a couple just right here so we can see. And these little grape-like sacs are actually air sacs and we call those alveoli. The alveoli is really important because that's where the gas exchange happens. This is where ultimately the oxygen is going to end up and where we'll pick up carbon dioxide to exhale out. So why is this important? Well, when we talk about pneumonia, the pneumonia, the infection is actually in these air sacs. So what I'm doing is I'm drawing these sacs as if we could blow them up millions and millions of times because they're actually very, very tiny. We have millions of them everywhere at the end of our airways. So if we could blow them up, they'd look something like this. Now right underneath it, I'm going to just keep drawing the, the kind of structure that we can expect that we'll see. So we have just air sacs have drawn. Right underneath our air sacs, we have tiny blood vessels that run beneath them and all around them. And in between our air sacs, 
we just have some lung tissue. So I'll just make that this brown color, make some lines to represent our lung tissue. So when we say that a person has pneumonia, the pneumonia infection is actually inside of these air sacs. And this is where the pneumonia is. Now, anytime that there's an infection or injury in the body, the body's response at that site is to cause inflammation. So that means that the tissue, the alveolar tissue, is going to inflame and it's going to leak fluid. Well, that fluid I'm making green and I'm filling up the alveoli with this green fluid to represent the infection. It's going to leak out infected fluid into this air sac. Now, why is this a problem? Well, remember, we're breathing in air, right? So let's come over here and make this blue. So let's say that here's my air. I'm just going to travel down some blue air and I'm breathing that down. I'm breathing that down. I'm breathing that down. And it's coming all the way down to our alveoli because this is where I want to drop off the oxygen so I can breathe and ultimately get the oxygen into my capillaries, right? Because that's what we need. The problem is, is that I kind of have this block. I have this infectious fluid that's blocking that absorption of oxygen and it's gonna block the exhalation of carbon dioxide as well. And that's a problem with pneumonia. It's taking up air space. So as you can see, if, if this person had pneumonia, and let's go ahead and even draw it on our smaller grid. Let's shade in some green into our alveoli here. If this person had pneumonia, what will we expect to see in them? Well, we can see that we have our air sacs being occupied with this infectious material. So think about how that's going to affect their breathing. One of the things that we're going to see is dyspnea, which really is a fancy term for difficulty breathing. The problem that we're having really is shortness of breath. So I'll just put short, short of breath. And that's because looking at our image, we see that we're not able to have that gas exchange. We can't get that oxygen into our space because it's being blocked by something else. They're going to be experiencing chest pain as well. And we know that's secondary to the inflammation that's happening at the alveolar level. And we have pain receptors in our chest, so we're going to feel that. How about cough? Thinking about all that fluid in our air sacs, what do you think the body's going to try to do? It's definitely going to try to cough, right? That's the mechanism that our body has. It's going to try to cough to squeeze out and force out that fluid out of the airways to clear it so we have room to breathe. And we keep talking about infection. So with an infection, you can expect to see a fever. And that can be low grade or that can be high grade. So how does this happen? How do we get a pneumonia infection? Well, there's really two ways. So it can be from organisms, right? Just that we get out in the community or it can be from other ways that might not fit into that category. So for the first one, I want you to think about organisms. So I'm gonna come over to the shoulder and I'm gonna draw in a circle. That's gonna represent my bacteria. And I'm gonna draw in a little viral illustration to represent a virus. Bacteria and viruses are certainly the most common causes of pneumonia. The good thing is, is that we have vaccines to combat two of the biggest culprits, which would be our streptococcus pneumoniae, that's our bacteria, and the flu virus. These are our big, big offenders that cause pneumonia infections. Now, when we pick up an organism like a bacteria or a virus, and we can also get funguses and mycoplasmas as well, we call this community acquired. And I'm gonna write that here, community acquired pneumonia. And when I say pick up, I mean just in our everyday activities. Community, you're thinking about people. So think about work or school, or you're out doing leisure activities. Because you're surrounded by people, and if you picked up an organism from somebody that was ill, we would call that community-acquired pneumonia. Now, just as we have air, we know that the, the transmission of air into our lungs, if we get a bacteria that enters our airway, it's going to travel down and it's going to cause its infection. Now, we said we would talk about other ways. Something that falls under our other way would be ventilator-assisted or ventilator-acquired pneumonia. So I'm going to write that here. Ventilator acquired pneumonia. Let me do better. Pneumonia. So someone's on a ventilator. We know that they're connected to a tube that's delivering oxygen to them. 
So let's come over here and actually just erase, erase away my, my little air symbol that I made earlier. That way we can make room for our tube. And I'm just gonna put it down to here. Now in this orange color, let's draw in this tube. So we know the tube is inserted through the mouth or through the nose, and then it's guided down into the airway. And it'll end about here. So this tube is going to be delivering oxygen to this patient. Well, on the outside, this tube is actually connected to a device. And so I'm going to write O2 here because we know that's doing the work of breathing for them. Well, what's the problem with this? We know that because it's a direct route from the outside to the inside, that things like bacteria, viruses, other harmful organisms can actually get inside of the tube, can grow and cause an ammonia infection. Another way that we can get pneumonia that, that doesn't quite fit under our community acquired or ventilator acquired would be aspiration. Now aspiration means to breathe in. And in this case, we would be breathing in something into the lungs that shouldn't be there. So let's get rid of our tube so we can visualize aspiration. Now I want you to really think about patients that are at greatest risk for this, like patients that have been experiencing vomiting, for instance. We could aspirate vomit into our lungs. Now if you take a look at that yellow object that I said don't focus on earlier, take a look at that now and see how it's moving. This yellow object is our epiglottis. Our epiglottis really directs traffic. We know that we have one main tube, but this tube actually is split into two. One route's gonna go to the stomach and one route's going to go to our lungs. So let me leave that open for a second and let's, let's see the difference. So in blue here, this is going to be our direct route to our lungs. And then in green here, this would be our route to our stomach. It's all just keep that going down like it's going to our stomach. Well, in the event that our epiglottis is open, that means that something can get inside of our airway. So in this case, we talked about vomit. If somebody was vomiting and our epiglottis is open, we can actually aspirate the vomit into our lungs. And because our lungs are a sterile environment, Anything that gets in there that's carrying bacteria is a danger to us because it can make us very sick. The same thing can happen with somebody that is eating and accidentally aspirates the food into their lungs. Okay, Legionnaire's disease caused by an aerobic gram-negative bacteria that causes atypical pneumonia. Um, Legionellus pneumophilia contaminates various water sources ranging from lakes to hot water and air conditioning distribution systems of large buildings because they can accumulate moisture, right? And it can provide an environment where the bacteria can grow. You can have transmission through inhalation of contaminated water droplets. It's an intracellular pathogen, which after phagocytosis by white blood cells, um, the bacteria generates a fusion of the phagosome and the, the lysosome, it, it basically keeps that from happening, okay? And so what happens is he, he lives in this little room inside the white blood cell where he can't be destroyed because the lysosome won't fuse with the phagosome. Remember that the lysosome contains powerful proteolytic enzymes that destroy anything they come into contact with. So he basically hitches a ride inside the white blood cell, okay? Uh, the next thing that we want to talk about is tuberculosis okay this used to be called consumption back in the late 1800s early 1900s okay so let's take a listen <laughs> tuberculosis or TB disease TB is spread through the air from one person to another. When a person breathes in TB bacteria, it can settle in the lungs and begin to grow. It is caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis, which usually attacks the lungs. It can also attack any part of the body, including the kidneys, spine, and brain. It can be fatal if not treated properly. 
Some people have serious side effects from TB medications. Should you develop any, you must call your doctor or nurse right away. So I've drawn out for you a mother over here, a mom, and her son on the right. And it turns out that mom has tuberculosis. Let's assume that. And sometimes when you see tuberculosis written out the way I'm writing it out, you'll actually see them shorthanded or kind of use the, the quick way of saying it, which is two letters, which is TB. So let's say mom has TB. Now this is actually a diagnosis, right? This is a description of her illness. This is telling us what she actually has, what she's sick with. But we have to remember that tuberculosis is actually caused by an organism, right? It's actually caused by a bacteria, it turns out. And this bacteria has the name myco, M-Y-C-O, bacterium, mycobacterium tuberculosis. So this is actually a very easy one to remember because tuberculosis is right here in the name. Now I should point out mycobacterium tuberculosis is actually not the only cause of tuberculosis. Turns out there are a few other kind of related mycobacterium, using this word myco, uh, that also cause TB. But this one, the one I wrote out for you, this is definitely the most common around the world, and that's the one I'm going to focus on. And in fact, this myco, M-Y-C-O, this is actually Greek for the term fungus. And the reason that this is here actually kind of tells us a little bit about how this bacteria grows because it grows really slowly like a fungus. And that's actually the reason that they use the term myco. But nevertheless, it is a bacteria. And so if we're going to put a little bracket around the diagnosis, I also want to put a little bracket around this part to kind of distinguish the two. So now you can see very clearly TB, the diagnosis, is caused by a bacteria. So now let's talk about how mom, who we said already is sick with TB, I'm going to actually just sketch out what her lungs might look like, assuming that the TB is in her lungs. Uh, this is actually the, the most common place we think of with TB, but not the only place. But let's say that she's got little red, I'm going to draw it in red, bacteria here in her lungs, uh, causing her to be very, very sick with tuberculosis. You know, she could spread it to her son. But what are the different ways that she might spread it? What are the most common ways? Well, let me sketch out a few possibilities, and we're going to go over whether these possibilities are very likely or unlikely to be uh, a way for her to spread disease uh, to her son. So let's say first, you know, they're sharing this delicious pizza I'm drawing here. They're, you know, let's say they're very into pizza and they, you know, like to share food. And they both, you know, chow down on this little pizza here. That's one way they might potentially, you might think of as a, as a way to spread it. Uh, maybe they're even sharing a drink. Maybe there's a drink here. You know, and this drink, you know, they're sharing again. You might also think about, you know, what's going on in their house. Maybe they're opening and closing doors and maybe they're touching doorknobs. There's another way, right? Maybe they're touching stuff uh, in common. Uh, maybe she says to him, hey, here, grab these keys. And she's been holding the keys all day, and then she gives him the keys, and he holds the keys. You know, there's another way, right? Maybe the TB can touch objects in the environment, like a doorknob or a, or a key. And then there's the most obvious way you might be thinking. Maybe she's coughing. Maybe she has a, a loud cough. You know, maybe she's coughing all day, and some of these bacteria get in the air, right? So that's another way that you might imagine that the bacteria could spread from her to her son. So different ways, right? Now of these ways, uh, I'm going to actually label this one over here. Let's say this is through the air. Which are the most common ways to be really concerned about TB spreading? And I'm actually going to just put it in green so it really sticks out. The most common way is what we call person to person through the air. So in this case, the, the first person would be mom because she's sick. And it's going to go through the air down to her son. And these other ways, you know, for example, food and drink, that's really not so common. That's really, really unlikely to be a way of spreading TB. And in fact, even this down here is really not likely either. So the idea of getting TB by sharing food and drink or touching objects in your environment like the keys or the doorknob or things like that, that's really not how TB spreads usually. Usually it's spread through the air. And one person, the sick person, is usually coughing a lot and then the other person might breathe it in. So let me make a little bit of space on this canvas, and let's talk about what happens next. 
I'm going to draw one alveolus here, and then I'm going to copy it a few times just so you can see a few different possibilities in terms of what might happen. And these represent the sun's alveoli. These are the sun's alveoli. Now, of course, these are the tiny little air sacs at the very ends of the bronchial tree, right? So let me make a few copies of this. So there we go. We have four possibilities, right? Possibility one, two, three, and four. I'm basically going to go through different scenarios, different things that might happen when mom coughs. So maybe she coughs, and the first possibility could be that the bacteria, you know, they just don't get far enough. They don't actually make it to the sun, and he never ends up breathing them in. So if this was the case, there would be no uh, bacteria in his alveoli. Of course, his, his lungs are nice and clean. Let me draw his lungs in. They look nice and clean with no bacteria, and he's feeling great, right? This is, this is our son over here feeling really good. And we would say basically in this case, in scenario one, he's healthy because the bacteria never even got to his lungs. All right, now scenario two. Let me actually erase a couple of these. Let's say that the cough actually was you know, very strong and he was close by and he ended up breathing some of these in through his nose or his mouth and they went down into his lungs, right? So that's another possibility. Once the bacteria get there, let me actually draw them on this little alveoli. You know, in possibility number two, they might actually get picked up by little immune cells. So he has little cells that are patrolling the lungs, making sure they're nice and clean and healthy. And these little immune cells, I'm going to label them over here. These are macrophages. Macrophages. Actually, this literally means big eater because phage means to eat. And so these immune cells, they might kind of come by and gobble up these bacteria and take them in and destroy them. That's another possibility. So that would be possibility number two. So here the bacteria are gone. Now let's play it out again. Let's say scenario three. Also, you have a couple of bacteria in here. And just as before, you get a couple of immune cells that come by and they swallow up these little bacteria. These are the macrophages I'm drawing, swallowing up the bacteria. But let's say that unfortunately, in scenario three now, these macrophages, for whatever reason, cannot destroy the bacteria. The bacteria are still living, and that's why I draw them here as little red dots. They're still living, still there. And now let me draw the fourth scenario, which is, again, let's say a couple of bacteria get in, and let's say that you know the immune cells, again, they kind of you know, get alerted, and they kind of come by and pick up one of them. Maybe this immune cell is trying to go after this other one. Maybe he's really close by. But here the key difference is that these bacteria are actually multiplying. So I'm actually going to draw lots of them. These bacteria are multiplying and they're filling up this space. So this space is filling up with little tiny red bacteria. So the key difference here is that these ones are multiplying. And we didn't really talk about the other scenarios having bacteria that are multiplying. But now that's the, the key new thing here. And in this scenario, we would call it active because you're actually seeing the bacteria thriving. We call this active TB infection, active TB infection. And that goes back to kind of what we would label the other scenarios, these ones. And these ones together, we actually call both of them latent TB infection, latent TB infection. And the reason I'm putting them together is because it's very hard, very hard clinically to distinguish scenario two from scenario three. Because in both cases, the immune system has previous experience with the TB bacteria. It's seen the TB bacteria. And in both cases, you're not seeing lots and lots of bacteria dividing or multiplying. So we lump these together and call them both latent TB infection. The real key, and this is you know kind of the take home that I want to point out, is that there is a difference then between healthy, uh, someone that's really never seen TB in their life before, latent, where you have seen TB previously, but you don't have any uh, bacteria that are multiplying, and active TB infection, where you have lots and lots of TB bacteria that are multiplying. Let me make just a little bit more space then. I'm going to focus now on just this final one, this multiplying uh, active TB infection situation. So if, let's say our son in this case, gets tuberculosis from mother or from mom, 
and let's say unfortunately he has an active TB infection, what are some clues to tell us that he has an active infection? So if I'm trying to figure out if somebody has TB, I always think about two key things. What are their symptoms? What are they sick with? That's the first thing. And then how long is it going on for? And I'm going to call that duration. And these two offer really, really helpful clues to figuring out if someone has TB. And with symptoms, I'm going to break it up into two categories. The first is constitutional. Constitutional. And this is constitutional symptoms. And this is kind of things that affect the whole body. The whole body. So I'm just going to put a little bracket around the entire body to, to remind us of that. And this could be things like, you know, fevers or chills. You know, you can't say, you know, you can't really point to one part of your body and say, this is the part that's having fevers and chills. You'd say, well, just generally, I feel awful. Uh, this could be things like night sweats. If you wake up and your uh, t-shirt is all wet, you might say, well, those are night sweats. Another example of a constitutional symptom is weight loss. Uh, in particular, when you're not trying to lose weight, uh, especially because you're maybe not eating as much or you're vomiting or anything like that. And now the other category is lower respiratory tract. I'm going to say respiratory. I'm going to abridge it to just RESP tract. And this, if I want to draw it in, would basically be kind of the part I've drawn in blue here. So going down from your voice box all the way to the alveoli. So this would be your lower respiratory tract. And you can think about what sort of symptoms you might have there, right? So it could be things like coughing, right? That would be coming from the lungs. If you're coughing very hard, you might have some blood or some little streaks of red that are blood uh, in your sputum. So it could be bloody sputum. That would be another one. And the sputum, of course, is just the mucus stuff that you kind of cough up. And a lot of people that are coughing this much, they might have uh, trouble breathing or, you know, chest pain anything like that. So these are kind of just some examples of lower respiratory tract symptoms. And so I always think in my head, okay, are they having constitutional symptoms? If so, I put a check there. Are they having some lower respiratory tract symptoms? If so, I put a check there. And then how long is it going for? And usually with things like uh, active TB infection, I'm thinking it's got to be usually more than three weeks. So more than three weeks. And this is, again, focusing on TB of the lungs or the pleura, which is the space around the lungs. Generally, the symptoms have gone on for a little while. So these then become very helpful clues to figuring out if someone actually has active TB infection. Okay, so the way that this works is that you, you usually inhale spores of the tubercle bacillus, right? They're phagocytized by wandering macrophages, which are always around the lungs, and then they survive there within those phagolysosomes, right? A delayed hypersensitivity reaction is going to develop where you get small, hard tubercles or granulomas around the site of the infection. They develop into caseous lesions, which have a cheese-like consistency, and calcify into hardened gone complexes on x-rays. So what this does is it destroys the alveoli in the lungs and coats them with material that impedes gas exchange. All right, it also reduces the elasticity of the lungs and it can cause bleeding, okay? Latent tuberculosis are where the bacilli contained by the immune system um, reside in those white blood cells. In this form, it's not infectious, while the primary disease is characterized by a productive cough they generate sputum, fever, night sweats, and weight loss. These patients have active TB and are contagious, and frequently um, they're going to cough up blood. Okay, um, the treatment: antibiotics. Okay, you can see some examples here. Um, the arrow in this figure is pointing to a gone complex in a patient's upper right lobe. Okay, so you can see how extensive the damage is in the lung tissue. Normally the lung tissue is uh, extremely porous, very lightweight, and has lots of surface area. But when this stuff begins to accrue in the lungs, you're reducing the ability of gas exchange to happen. Right? Mycobacteria can resist decoloration when they're washed in acidified ethanol, and under the microscope they appear as red bacilli in the tissue. This is uh, zeal Nielsen staining uh, and is also referred to as acid fast, okay? Uh, and this is the agent of tuberculosis, 
right? Mycobacteria tuberculosis, okay? All right, fungal diseases, right? Here, um, the entry again is through the respiratory tract. Um, usually what you're inhaling are spores. Fungal spores are tough. They resist poor environmental conditions, and then when they get to the right environment, they become um, vegetatively active. They grow again with mycelia and, and um, uh, sexual and asexual reproduction. Okay? The infection is usually associated with occupational and recreational activities in wooded areas along waterways where there's more, most moist soil and spores. Remember that fungi are saprophytes, and so they live off of dead, decaying material. So that's what basically soil is. Um, you often see fungi, for instance, if you walk through the woods after a hard rain, you come across a rotting log. You'll see mushrooms sprouting up, and they're a type of fungus. Well, the same goes for these other types of fungi, right? So where you see this, you're probably going to be in a, a spore-rich area. That's one of the reasons we really worry about things like water damage in a home, right? Because that'll lead to fungal growth and you can end up with these kinds of infections. Fungal infections aren't acquired uh, from the environment and are not person-to-person -person transmitted, right? They're the result, again, of contact with these spores, okay? Blastomyces dermatitis is a dimorphic fungus that resides in the soil of the Ohio and Mississippi River Valley and in the southeastern United States, and this is a fungal colony of that pathogen, right? Other fungal infections, um, coccidiomycosis, which is endemic in the United States, histoplasmosis, which is a flu-like illness, you end up with erythema nodosum, arthritis and arthralgia, okay, blastomycosis, which is caused by a dimorphic fungus, and cryptococcosis, um, which can involve the skin, the lungs, the prostate, urinary tract, the eyes, the bones, and the joints, okay? Um, what I'll do is I'll show you a little bit about each of these uh, following uh, this podcast, and I will see everybody in the next podcast. So I thank you for listening. Histoplasmosis is the topic for this video, and histoplasmosis is caused by histoplasma capsulatum. Now this is what? Is it a bacteria? Is it a virus? It is a fungus. And this fungus goes and infects the lungs and can also cause disseminated disease by entering into the bloodstream. Now histoplasmosis occurs worldwide Questions on licensing exams often list certain specific geographic regions. For example, in the United States, they will list certain uh, states where the patient lives or where the patient may have recently gone to, sort of as a clue that the patient has developed histoplasmosis. And I'll list a few of the places, Ohio, Mississippi, Pennsylvania, New York, Maine, which is a state in the northeast part of the United States. So just keep that in mind if you have a clinical vignette that mentions a patient who is either lives in one of these places or has gone there recently um, and then later developed symptoms. So histoplasmos Sis is the name of the medical condition, and histoplasma, capsulatum, is the name of the bug or the fungus. So why does a patient get this medical condition? Well, it's associated with bird and bat droppings or litter. And this is a very important part of uh, the etiology of this medical condition. And oftentimes, the clinical vignette will talk about a farmer or somebody that has gone to some caves or gone into the woods because these are the areas where bird or bat droppings are present. Now, the infection 
occurs when the person inhales the spores produced by the fungus histoplasma capsulatum and the infection involves the lungs and then it can spread hematogenously to other organs. So now let's talk a little bit about the symptomatology of histoplasmosis. A lot of the symptoms of histoplasmosis are very similar to the symptoms of pneumonia such as fever, a cough, chest pain. In addition to these symptoms, patient will also develop a malaise, feeling of fatigue, muscle pain, myalgias. And there's also a specific physical exam finding that I wanted to mention called erythema nodosum. Erythema nodosum is um, a condition where the patient will have tender nodules on their shins. And I have a photo of it I'd like to show you. This is erythema nodosum. And um, this combined with the pneumonia-like symptoms combined with a recent visit to one of the geographic regions where histoplasmosis can be acquired should uh, give you a very good picture of this uh, medical condition. And uh, one final thing before I get into the diagnosis is that there is a disseminated type of histoplasmosis. It's called progressive disseminated histoplasmosis and it occurs as an opportunistic infection in AIDS patients. So that is uh, very important actually in um, the symptomatology of a person that is immunocompromised. So now let's talk about the diagnosis of histoplasmosis. There are several things that you can do to diagnose it. You don't have to do all of them, but part of the diagnostic workup, of course, includes a chest x-ray, which will show a mass lesion. It will show uh, lymphadenopathy. The next test that can be done, which is a bit invasive, is called a tissue biopsy, and that will show the yeast. Cultures, of course, are very important. Cultures of the blood, sputum, and urine. And one test that is uh, very important in the diagnostic work of a histoplasmosis is something called antigen testing. And this is a test that detects the histoplasma capsulatum antigen. And it can be detected in either the urine or the serum. And the good thing about this test is that it's more sensitive than the blood culture. So those are the tests involved in histoplasmosis. And finally, the treatment. If you have a mild to moderate case of histoplasmosis, it can be treated with a antifungal medication known as itraconazole. All the uh, antifungal medications um, tend to have an azole ending. And then a severe case of histoplasmosis is treated with a very powerful drug known as amphotericin B, which unfortunately has a lot of side effects. So it's really only reserved for severe cases. So now let's uh, go into some of the clinical vignettes. 54-year-old farmer in rural Pennsylvania presents to the physician with chronic cough. Chest x-ray demonstrates a mass lesion with hilar lymphadenopathy. Biopsy of the mass demonstrates multiple tiny yeast forms within macrophages. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? It's a nice clinical vignette, relatively short, that give you a lot of clues that point toward histoplasmosis. Next one, 48-year-old woman comes to the office because of painful, tender nodules on her shins. She is a resident of New York City. After the recent terrorist attacks, she was concerned and left the city for a week. She took a vacation to her sister's place in Maine, a rural area with heavily wooded 
backyard. On return to New York, she developed a dry, hacking cough and a painful, red, tender nodules on her shins bilaterally. The nodules, which developed one day after the onset of cough, rapidly increased in size and became more tender. She is alarmed that she had developed anthrax and came to the office. She has no past medical history, is not on any meds, reports no allergies, and has never been hospitalized before. She does not smoke, drinks alcohol on social occasions. On exam, except for the large red nodules that are seen on both shins, no other abnormalities are noted. CBC, BMP, and chest x-ray are within normal limits. The patient should be investigated for. Now, this is, of course, the erythema nodosum that they're describing. And combined with her recent trip to a wooded area in Maine and the hacking cough, she should be investigated for histoplasmosis. And finally, 32-year-old previously healthy an athletic male resident of Portsmouth, Ohio, is diagnosed with having CAP, Community Acquired Pneumonia, based on setting fever to 101, cough, physical findings, and clinical stability. He is treated with clarithromycin by prescription for a 10-day course. On the fifth day, he still has a fever of 100.8, unchanged cough, and continued malaise. After a chest x-ray reveals miliary distribution of bilateral pulmonary infiltrates, a TB skin test is read as negative. Further history reveals that he had been spelunking two weeks before the onset of symptoms. Histoplasmosis is now a consideration which of the following would be the best test at this point to confirm the diagnosis. Well, for those of you who don't know, spelunking is the exploration of caves as a hobby. Now this patient probably has developed histoplasmosis, so let's go through these tests and choose the best one. Histoplasmosis skin test, not really part of the diagnostic workup. The next one is a biopsy, that's a bit invasive, although it can be done, it's probably not the best one immediately. Urine test for histoplasma antigen, that's a good one, we'll keep that one. Again a biopsy. Uh, that's also invasive and then a blood culture so the best test would probably be the least invasive so I'll cross out B and D so now we're left with either the urine test for the antigen or the blood culture and if you remember I had previously mentioned that the antigen test is more sensitive than the blood culture so between all of these the best choice is choice C Cryptococcosis is a disease caused by the fungus Cryptococcus. Cryptococcus is a type of fungus that is found in the soil, usually in association with bird droppings. The major species of Cryptococcus that cause illness in humans is Cryptococcus neoformans, which is found worldwide. Another less common species that can cause disease in humans is Cryptococcus gatti. Since 1999, Cryptococcus gatti has also been found in regions of the Pacific Northwest, particularly in Vancouver Island in British Columbia, and Oregon and Washington in the United States. Cryptococcus neoformans typically infects immunocompromised persons. Most people in the United States who develop this infection are HIV infected or have other conditions affecting their immune system. However, occasionally persons with no apparent immune system problems develop cryptococcosis. A wide range of animals can also develop Cryptococcus neoformans cryptococcosis. The spores from Cryptococcus neoformans live in bird droppings, especially pigeon droppings, and in soil contaminated with bird droppings. Humans can get cryptococcal infection by the inhalation of airborne fungi which are spread from these sources. Cryptococcosis is not known to be spread from person to person, animal to animal, or from animals to humans. Infection may cause a pneumonia-like illness with shortness of breath, coughing, and fever. Skin lesions may also occur. Another common form of cryptococcosis is central nervous system infection. Symptoms may include fever, headache, or a change in mental status. To prevent Cryptococcus neoformans infections, people who have weakened immune systems should avoid areas contaminated by bird droppings and should avoid contact with birds. Infections with Cryptococcus gatti have occurred in both healthy persons without compromised immune systems and in persons with conditions affecting their immune system. A wide range of animals can also develop cryptococcosis from exposure to Cryptococcus gatti. 
Its spores appear to live in association with certain trees and the soil around trees. Humans can become infected by the inhalation of airborne fungi, which are spread from these sources. These are just a few things to know about Cryptococcus fungi. To learn more, please visit the website shown on the screen. IAQ TV, the place to be. Hello everyone, welcome to Scardia.com. My name is Dr. Saima Mushtaq and our today's topic of infectious medicine is coxidiodomycosis and blastomycosis. The outlines which we will discuss for these two uh, infectious, uh, these two uh, fungal infections, in the first we will talk about the etiology. What are the fungi which cause coxidiodomycosis and blastomycosis? What's the appearance of those uh, uh, fungi and then what are some characteristic features of those? Fungi. Next, we will talk about the pathogenesis of both uh, these fungal infections, uh, how it develops and how the infection or the spores enters the body. Next, we will talk about the pathology. And in this pathology, we will discuss the, uh, the microscopic appearance of the illness and how these uh, spherules or spores appear on, in, on microscopic examination. So pathology, we will discuss for coxidiodomycosis and blastomycosis. Next, we will discuss the clinical features of coxidiodomycosis and blastomycosis. Uh, in both these conditions, the primary site of involvement or the primary organ which is affected is the lungs because in both these uh, conditions, the uh, infection is caused by the inhalation of the spores. So lungs are mainly involved. Uh, and then the symptoms or features associated with these infections mainly involve the lungs and cause fever, cough, chills, uh, then we can have uh, fatigue. And besides the lungs, it can cause some disseminated uh, infection or features also. We will talk about all that in our today's lecture. Then we will discuss the diagnosis, which can be the uh, test on the serum serology testing for both the infections, including immunodiffusion, complement fixation test, then we will enzyme-linked immunoassay test, uh, sputum uh, culture, then we will talk about the test for the antigens present in the urine and the blood. So all that, we will talk about the diagnostic test performed for the diagnosis. 
then we will talk about the treatment and you will see that mostly the treatment for these fungal infections is by the antifungal drugs these uh, fungal infections they do not respond to antibiotic and main antifungal drugs which we use are the amphotericin b and then we use the other drugs like uh, fluconazole itraconazole ketone and what are the dosages for these uh, drugs we will talk about them in detail so all these topics will be discussed in our today's lecture of uh, blastomycosis and coccidiodomycosis and besides these lectures we have other lectures of infectious medicine available on the website of scardia.com you can visit our website to uh, look for these lectures also thanks for watching scardia.com